Hello and welcome to the eighth and final talk of Planted Country's Save Our Soil programme, brought to you in partnership with the National Trust and filmed on the deck of our beautiful off-grid cabin crafted by our friends at Out of the Valley. My name's Sam Peters, I'm one of the co-founders of Planted, the only design event aimed at reconnecting people and spaces with nature. At Planted, we aim to make the commercial case for nature and we'll be discussing how food, farming, architecture, design and nature can combine to create a cleaner, greener and more sustainable future. In this series of talks, we've been exploring why the earth is important for food, farming and nature and asking what role design can play in encouraging the use of local materials while reducing demand on our already overstretched natural resources. Today we're talking books, literature and learning. Nature writing has experienced a renaissance since the start of the COVID pandemic, of people, as people have reconnected with reading in the natural world. They say information is power, and it seems as our knowledge of our destructive relationship with nature grows, so too does our determination to chart it, explore it, and change it. Isabella Tree's Wilding, the return, to nature, return of nature to a British farm, James Rebank's English Pastoral, and Benedict MacDonald's Rebirding, are just three from a long list of seminal books published in the last few years which have opened our eyes to the possibility of a new relationship with nature based not just on protecting the status quo but based on regenerating, rewilding and rebalancing our relationship with the natural world. Some believe a silent revolution is occurring before our eyes and I'm delighted to welcome three experts in this field from whom I've personally learned a huge amount over the past couple of years. To my left here, Jonathan Thompson under, uh, from Underhill Wood Nature Reserve. In 2020, Jonathan wrote a rewilding manual booklet describing what he has done and learned to Underhill Wood Re Nature Reserve in the last seven years since he began the process of rewilding the 22-acre site. The manual draws on the steps Jonathan has taken to develop and enhance a range of habitats and what he has learned through his work. Jonathan has read wi widely and this knowledge underpins what he has done at UWNR and the contents of the manual. To Jonathan's left, Keggy Carew, author of Beastly. Keggy won the Costa Biography of the Year in 2016 for her memoir Dadland and Quicksand Tales followed in 2019. Beastly, which will be published by Canongate in, in January 2023, tracks the gargantuan story of our paradoxical relationship with the animal world, our journey from apes to angels and back to apes. Amber Harrison, to Keggy's left, co-founder of Fold Dorset, Fold is an independent shop focused on nature writing that opened in 2021, to my personal delight, on Shaftesbury's iconic Gold Hill. Fold was inspired by Amber and co-founder Karen's shared love for the countryside and recognition of the restorative value of being in nature. Amber also maintains a role as an advisor to the companies keen to make progress on sustainability goals and is a, a member of Booksellers Association's Green Task Force. Keggy, Jonathan and Amber, thank you so much for being here with us on the stage today. So let's start this off. I've talked about a, re a renaissance in nature writing, a silent revolution going on. Keggy, why don't I start with you? Is that a fair description of how a things are progressing? A silent revolution. Gosh, uh, it's quite loud revolution in a way. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of very different types of nature books. It's quite political. There's a lot of political writing. Trespassing, uh, about trespassing, about uh, Mark Avery, is a very political writer about grouse driven wolves, so trying to bring it an awareness. There's um, uh, people who write about walking, like Robert McFarlane, and there's people who write, uh, uh, and landscape, there's people who write about the wild, like Jay Griffiths, there's people, so there's a whole different, there's so, the science writers, and, um, and I think there's quite a few danger areas that we could fall into where you know we've um destroyed nature and now we're expecting it to fix us because we've got mental health problems because we're so depressed about it instead of doing the kind of we're gonna heal nature to heal ourselves you know by healing i think um Anne michaels is a wonderful writer she wrote a book called fugitive pieces and she said um you must give what you most need and I think it's really time to give back. And I think people are really trying to give back uh, to nature. Um, it's the most important thing, I think. But creatures, for me, are, are, are the key because they, they actually will be our saviors from very tiny to, the, you know, from, top, from bottom 
up and from top down, that, that those very complicated interrelations between animals um, and ourselves and the world that we live in. You know, they, they, life creates life. And, um, and the more we learn, the more hope there is, I think. So. Thanks, Kegi. Amber, you've obviously opened a, a bookshop at exactly the time that it seems that people are engaging <laughs> with nature writing in a way that perhaps, certainly not in my lifetime, I've seen it. But, I mean, what's it been like for you the last couple of years or, or less, in fact, since you, since you guys opened, um, seeing this new, newfound engagement with nature writing? I think it's been interesting. When we have in the shop, we're sort of broadly based around land, sea and self, and those are the topics that we look at. And we have what we lovingly refer to as our nature classics shelf, which are the writers like Robert McFarlane and, and um, Rachel Carson for Silent Spring. But also we're seeing much more engagement with younger readers, which is a very positive thing, and lots of books which allow intergenerational reading. So whether it's books which introduce young readers to nature or books where parents or grandparents can talk about nature and what that means and share their own stories of growing up in villages or towns where you could hear the bird song, where you could see the butterflies, where you'd know the plants and herbs in the city. And that's been quite interesting. And they're not all doom and gloom. And I think that's a really important part. It can get, as you said, quite depressing if you look at it. So that's a resurgence we've seen. And then there's also a big kind of drive around uh, nature writing as memoirs. There's classics obviously like Richard Maybe, but there's lots of new nature writing that comes through around how it has helped people cope with difficult and challenging situations. And again, I think you know, we're seeing, particularly with the resurgence of people being immersed in nature because there was nothing else to do during the COVID time, there's been an understanding and a search for what those noises and those sounds and those colours and textures are that comes through. But what I also like to see is that you do have this kind of active engagement in nature. So the Book of Trespass, which is possibly the most discussed book over Christmas lunch, if anything from the shop was to go by, um, who has access to England. How do you make the changes to get accessibility into nature? That's a really big theme that comes yeah. through too. Fascinating. Jonathan, you've become something of a kind of literature um, guru of mine, I suppose, over the last couple Have of years. I? Every, sing <laughs> every time I, uh, I come and visit the, uh, your amazing reserve, um, I go away with a list of 10 books, which uh, every so often I manage to get through one or two of them. But, you know, you, you've given me a real list of amazing books to read over the last couple of years. Uh, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson was, uh, I mean, jaw-droppingly scary, I think, from my perspective, but also a, something that I'll, a book that I'll sort of remember for a very, very long time, which you said I must read quite early on. From a from a another one which I think is obviously very important has been Isabella Tree's Wilding Book. Mm -hmm. uh, you're someone who's been actively rewilding a 22-acre site now mm -hmm. um, in East Knoll, not too far down the road from here. Um, what, from your perspective, how how exciting is it that the engagement with rewilding now through the literature that's out there, including your own manual, um, seems to be really cutting through now that there is this positive optimistic message uh, and way of um, actually regenerating nature rather than just sort of protecting what we've got um so in fact two things i want to just go back to the the can i just go back to the silent revolution Absolutely. and and, yep. uh, and carson so it was interesting as you were saying that and then uh, immediately rachel carson's book popped mm -hmm. into my mind and amber mentioned it and in dave goulson's most recent book silent earth mm -hmm. he talks about the stalled revolution because Carson wrote 60 years this year, so it's basically my lifetime, she wrote Silent Spring. I can, uh, can they hear? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, sh she wrote Silent Spring 60 years ago, which is basically my lifetime. And I think there was a, a probable belief, Goulson talks about this, that that gave rise to a shift in how people viewed the relationship between chemical farming and planetary health. And that revolution died, it withered. And I think it's a salutary lesson in terms of, I'm not sure if there's a revolution, but if there is one that we don't let this one fade, because the first one did. You know, and it's and it's only sort of because they thought it would never happen again. They would they, never exactly. do the, the DDT problem would never happen again, yes. and we were complacent. Mm. That, that and it's still been used. DDT is still legally used in seventy countries. Mm. 
So, Keggy, could you just, for um, anyone in the audience who hasn't read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, could you give a, a, a or, or, or Jonathan, if you prefer, just a very brief well, Jonathan, kind of outline you, you, of, of you what the book did. is about, what, it, what so are the topics so, it's addressed? So, okay, so Carson was a, a marine biologist. She was an oceanographer, so that was her, her so she was an ecologist. And um, she wrote a book particularly about DDT use in America. Um, and DDT, DDT was used, they sprayed Manhattan. So they used to spray the suburbs of American cities to control pests. And she was, she sort of Birds went... Birds used to literally drop out of the sky. Well, they'd, they'd spray them from yeah. aeroplanes. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd be sitting in your sort of suburban garden having lunch and a crop duster would go over yeah. your garden and spray you, the children, the dog, the cat, you so know, the, the gerbils. Completely <laughs> in, indiscriminate spraying just of a, just a highly toxic uh, chemical. Uh, and the... the, the the US equivalent of DEFRA at the time supported this because it was about sort of, you know, managing the invertebrate sort of plague. Um, and the interesting, I think the interesting thing actually is what happened to her after the book. Um, and she developed cancer and died very soon after the book was published. And she had a pretty miserable time post-publication because the chemical companies, they went after her. Mm -hmm. And and as Keggy said, that, that thing then just withered. Um, but, so the law, but the law changed after her, you know. The, well, I think it, it, was, it was Kennedy. I yes. think it was Kennedy yeah. that changed things. Um, yeah. Yeah. So then going back to your thing about rewilding, so yes, I think there is a, a, a movement, and I think Isabella's book sort of shifted the whole rewilding topic, and it became mainstream. Um, prior to the, the publication of, I think there were two books, I think Feral and, Re and Wilding, mm -hmm. those two put books helped to push the concept sort of uh, and make it more popular you know prior to that it was sort of locked up in academic journals I think there is a, cha a shift I've had I run rewilding workshops at the land and I've had 70 odd people in the uh, last year and a half through those workshops I've got a four A4 pages on my laptop of people on a waiting list so there is a desire for people to learn about rewilding and then rewild land they own I think there's a tension, though, which hasn't worked its way through yet between the rewilding movement and the farming movement. Mm -hmm. I think this is a... I had a farmer at a rewilding workshop uh, last summer who talked about us and you. So us being the farmers and you being the rewilders. Mm -hmm. And he thought there was a sort of a, a, a... And I think he's right. I think there is a tension around that. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I think it's a really positive thing. I, I think it has a place... Um, I think rewilding Britain is doing a really good job of getting it into the public uh, public sort of space, but it's <coughs> it's a work in progress. Jake Take Fines it. on the radio this morning actually put it nicely he, uh, on farming today, and he said it's about finding spaces for nature in our farming and food structures, and that's really what it is about. It's, so it's about doing it on, on, on unprofitable land and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about taking out farms and not being able to eat because we've got wild wolves running around the place and it's just not that. <laughs> it's bringing back nature where we can, I think. Yep. Yeah. Yes, I think Higgy's right. I think there are lots of misconceptions mm. about what it is. We had Derek Gow on the panel uh, for one of our talks on uh, regenerative farming. Um, I mean, what an amazing man he is uh i've just read his brilliantly titled bringing back the beaver which is a memorable title but also the content of the book is a uh, it's hugely educational but presented in a in a way that probably or a style that is unique to derek um <laughs> but i think one of the questions we, we i asked him was just why is there this why is that tension there you've touched on the kind of the, the big forces of corporate power um uh the big chemical companies as well but this idea that rewilding and also um uh hayes uh book on uh, the book of trespass mm -hmm. which is a, a another hugely important book obviously but there's this sense that if you're making the case for nature through literature or in any on any platform indeed that it's it's in some way subversive or it's in some way kind of you're, you're challenging the status quo so what, what, could, would you care to explore that subject a little bit keggy um, challenging the status quo. I think, yeah, it's problematic. I don't, I think generally as humans, we've got these two, uh, one of the things that I played around with when I was writing Beastly was this, the, this tension between these human 
um, these two very strong instincts of being of, of being human or characteristics, and one of them is our ability to cooperate. So through our collaboration, we have just gone way ahead of in, in our potential, and we you know we've got rockets to the moon, and we can do pretty much anything that we want. The downside of that is we're very tooled up, so that we can do an awful lot of damage with that with that. But on my own, I would struggle to make a fig leaf costume and live in the woods, probably. But, you know, collaboratively, we're very good. But the other side of our nature, which is very strong, is competition. And we're very competitive. And, we, you know, we, get, we feel challenged. And, and I, think, I think when you're used to doing something in a, one way, it's very hard to change that route. And we get set in our ways. That's the expression. We get set in our ways. It's also expensive. You know, if a farmer's That's set up with a whole load of kit and somebody's going to say, OK, now you've got to get this other kit to do a no-till thing and that doesn't work, it's annoying. Mm. <laughs> and also they're being paid to do it another way. So it's mm. just, it's very complicated. Lots of vested interests and lots of, you know, Challenge that, and who do you think you are, this person from New Zealand coming along telling us how to you know, rewild and stuff like that? It, I mean, Jonathan comes from a farming background, so that helps a lot, but it's, it, it's understandable uh, why there's these tensions. I, I think Kiki's point about payment, you know, it, 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 there's, there's something about who benefits from a, a better planet. We all do. We all have to pay people who own land to make their land better. And at the moment, our subsidy regime doesn't. And it's not looking like elms will either. Well, so it we, might. We, we don't we, know. Well, we had a farmer. We, we had a farmer. We had a visit recently. Um, and I have a particular sort of way of uh, dealing with the hedges at the land. Mm -hmm. And it creates a margin that runs from the base of the hedge out into a field of about five metres. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, I'm, I need to see the maths that shows that it is better for me to have that as a wild field margin, as a wild hedge margin, and I take it out of production and lose the money I would gain through the production, the productivity of that five metres. So I think there's something about, you know, we benefit from it, but somebody has to pay farmers. And I think there's a, we haven't moved Elms far enough yet. And ju again, just for the audience, for those who aren't aware, Elms being... Uh, environmental, environmental land management scheme, which is a sort of umbrella, it's an umbrella term for the shift away from the common agricultural policy. Mm -hmm. um, Some people, dare I say, have even suggested the natural benefit of Brexit. It, uh, <laughs> yeah. The common agricultural policy and the common fisheries policy were a disaster for Britain, mm -hmm. a complete disaster. I'm not a Brexiteer, but those two things were completely brilliant to get rid of. Um, Interesting. Amber, um, and Keggy, in fact, but, uh, but Amber first, if I may. Um, I'm particularly interested in this idea of sort of the politics of nature writing. Um, can you tell the audience a little bit uh, about Nick Hayes's book, The Book of Trespass? And again, Nick Hayes, for those of you who've been on the Planted website and seen some of our Planted in Unearthed interviews, was one of the first interviews we did, in fact, on Planted Unearthed, and it's one of the most viewed uh, interviews that we've got on the website. So um, I would recommend going and, uh, and having a look on the website uh, for Nick's interview there uh, yeah. after this event. But can you tell us a little bit about what that book talks of and uh, what, yeah. what, why it is seen as a slightly um, <laughs> subversive, challenging narrative? I think it is. And, and I mean, I'll start kind of with a story. Somebody came into the shop just before Christmas Eve and said, my father-in-law, he likes a bold discussion over the dinner table at Christmas. What have you got? <laughs> and it was easy. It was the Book of Trespass. And you turn over the back of it, and it has two facts which are horrifying, which draw you straight into the book, which is one of the great indicators of a good writer. The first is that 92% of land is privately owned and managed that you don't have access to. The other is that you don't have access to 96% of waterways. So rivers, ponds, lakes, reservoirs, you don't have access to go to. And that's horrifying. When you think about the places that people go to on a regular basis, they think about all the places you can't go to. And what he does is he talks about why that happens. He talks about the big landowners. He talks about the ways that barriers are put up to access land. And, you know, if you, if you did any walks through the countryside during lockdown, you might have seen the, um, the bull in field signs. Mm. That's a very simple way of preventing access to land. Mm. But also the way that hedges or fences were subtly moved or that 
directional signage was lost, all of those elements and how it's kind of rooted back into history and land ownership and all of those things that come together that prevent people from having the right to roam. Whereas in Scotland, you have the right to roam. In Finland, you have the right to roam and forage and collect. And we've kind of collectively lost that. And how do we come back and address that? One of the things I also like the book about the book is that he illustrates it beautifully. So it's a very engaging way to understand what can be quite a heavy topic at times and a frustrating. And pretty much everybody who's read it kind of sits there in a chair and huffs and puffs like, well, that's just... Good God, can you believe this? And you read bits out because you are so sort of astonished by the facts that come out. And he's just recently published The um, Trespasser's Companion. So how do you actually get access to that land? How are some of the ways that you can reclaim the rights that you didn't know you had and the things you didn't know you're missing? Because if you don't now, if you don't reclaim those pathways and those walkways, you lose them and they're gone. And that's it. And that's a terrifying prospect. Mm. I mean, the, as you rightly say, those statistics, I mean, I've, we moved to uh, a beautiful area of uh, the UK called mm -hmm. the Nadder Valley between Shaftesbury and Salisbury, which I think you guys all, all obviously know. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to move my family down there was because the Nadder Valley River is such a yeah. beautiful river. It's a chalk stream and it's just wonderful. And I didn't realise how restricted the access mm -hmm. was. And I'd always sort of felt this sort of sense that it's kind of like an un... un you can't put your finger on it when you're out in the countryside. You kind of feel like, am I meant to be here? Is this okay? Yeah. Um, and, but that right to roam, that right to gain access, which mm. I, I'm guessing in New Zealand is pretty much similar to, to Scotland or... No or way. Is, it, complete not? is it very opposite. restrictive there? Uh, no, it doesn't exist. No, okay, so there, sorry, so, so there is a right to roam is, is there. I mean, you, no. You, no. So no, no, you can't, can't go, go anywhere. anywhere. No, you can't go anywhere. Wow, okay, no. that's really and if surprising. You, do, you can get shot. Have, you get shot. Wow. So when I, when I was a kid all around the perimeter of our dairy farm, in fact, I would go and help Dad put new signs up when they rotted, we would have no trespass, <laughs> all dog shot. Wow. And that's really common, and we would put those on fence posts. Wow. And that's really common in New Zealand if you're... Keggy, in fact, it was interesting when Keggy and I first moved to New Zealand, Keggy were, well, sod this, I'm just going to walk across this field. And the next thing you'd hear, the sort of Land Rover start up and some mm. guys sort of bouncing along. The, no, it's like America. It, wow. it, it's, there's, so in terms of the, whatever the percentage is here in New Zealand, it's, you know, 0.1 of a percent. Mm. Incredible. I mean, it, so just a personal view that, you know, that, was it Dostoevsky who said you can't love what you don't know? But, yeah. you know, this idea of after... Um, uh, lockdown when there was this sort of flood to the to the seaside and people were littering mm. and it was mm. yeah you know, that's the other whose problem. fault is that is it that's the knowledge the you know that relationship between people and yes. natural yes, spaces yes, and, yes. and yeah. the environment they don't un know what they're meant to do so no. is that is that mm. part of the issue here I think you? education is the part I mean we we know an awful you know to know who the names of Henry VIII's wives and not know what the tree is outside your window is kind mm. of weird and that is quite common. Um, we don't know and it's not our fault because we're not taught, it's not valued. In fact, we should be celebrating because uh, recently Marie Colwell, Mary Colwell's mm. got the GCE for um, nature um, through natural history, yeah. uh, natural history yep. through, um, so that's a great mm. cause of celebration. Mm -hmm. And it's what Jonathan does at, at Underhill, is showing people uh, how, how things work. We've, we've got a wonderful guy collecting, uh, doing moth traps, be, uh, bat surveys and all sorts of things. And it's wonderful to see the kids suddenly be thrilled. But knowledge is exciting, you know, to understand how things work um, is much more exciting than just walking by something. I mean, dog mess bags, what's that about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, up our little lane, hanging in the bushes. It's kind of a, it's kind of a metaphor for not understanding what you know mm. anything really. But um, I mean, I think it's so. I'm just, no, this is interesting. I was in London a couple of weeks ago. I was in the city of London. I was walking along New Fetter Street, and they had beautiful, shiny, glossy building, and they had one tree, maybe a very young London plane, and it had concrete right round the base, and there was no other biodiversity or tree there so all those people in those buildings looking at that one tree which probably won't survive for a chunk yeah. of time afterwards and they don't understand that you know when they do go to the country there are different things you do because they're not immersed in it in their day-to-day -day journeys mm. and I thought it was incredibly sad and I, I was actually um, meeting a group of friends and we were 
ask to bring something that relates to sort of sustainability and how you live. And my walk to work every day is through Pine Walk and there's beech nuts and there's conkers and there's all sorts. And I thought, I'll take a seed head. I searched for half a day in London to find any kind of tree seed, an acorn. I found in the end one tiny, sickly little sycamore really, really. thing. And I was like, this is crazy. Well, this goes, leads to the lost words. Exactly, yeah. Um, Robert McFarlane's book about all the things they took out of the dictionary, like conkers and blue and acorns, or acorns and, yeah. and, it's, and the, you know, email and things have gone into the dictionary. But why would you take out conkers? Mm. Because no, they're irrelevant. Mm. It's, it's something I notice that the land is really distinct. You know, if you, and if you think about the British population and indeed pretty much all the developed world now, most people are urban. Mm. Mm. So most people live in urban centres. So what I find at the land happens a lot, particularly people from urban centres come and you have this completely, it's a, it's a weird thing where they're looking but they're not seeing. Mm. So they're looking at stuff but there's a sort of real passivity and, and it's actually really just interesting watching them engage. And if I do one of my guided walks with them, it's not really resonating. You know, it has no meaning. And I think it goes back to, you know, the lack of a GCSE and a lack of that connection in, in yes, cities. Yes, but then once you start to explain things, suddenly you can see the light go on and suddenly it'd be interesting. When, if you just have a little fact about, you know, the tadpole or whatever mm. it is, the toad that you're looking at, suddenly it becomes more interesting. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a really interesting um, social experiment. I think it was a supermarket in Belgium or France. And in the oh, fruit yeah. and vegetable section, they took out yes. all the fruits and vegetables you would lose if the bee population vanished. And they filmed people going in, and I think there were a couple of potatoes and maybe a turnip, mm. all good things. And they were just like, well, where is it all? Mm. And that was their way of very visually saying... Yes. This is what you will lose because people don't understand the role of biodiversity. That's yeah. So you've got to make it resonate and you've got to make it engaging and relevant to people's lifestyles because not everybody is lucky enough to live where we live or to have an interest in it that we do. Yeah, For a lot of people, they need to worry about putting food on the table, paying increasing electricity bills, yeah. making sure that their kids are safe and well. You know, it's not top of their mind. Yeah. So you've got to kind of come at it from several different angles and make it accessible for everybody. Yeah. But it's Jonathan. also the Sorry, responsibility of our leaders mm -hmm. is mm. D lacking mm -hmm. <laughs> because it really is the most important thing, the most important, the, cr the climate crisis. It all comes back to nature not functioning mm -hmm. in, mm. in the way that it can and, sh and should. And, um, you know, it's, we are in crisis, biodiversity crisis, climate crisis, all these things, and actually... What will fix it is letting nature will fix it. That, you know, whales are, you know, are incredible carbon sinks in themselves. They're the marine gardeners moving the nutrients around. The, the loss of so many whales during whaling that did tremendous damage and affected the climate. And letting these things come back can do... There's huge amounts of hope out there if only we can let it happen. Um, and so that's what most people are writing about, I think, with positive, you know, so yeah. there's a lot of positive, but it's also not to have writing as a consolation or as a replacement therapy for nature. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, you know, I think we do need to, to, to understand it properly. Um, Let's talk a bit more about the education piece, Jonathan. So, and, and this is Jonathan Thompson, of course, folds leading author or most best-selling author we, we sell an awful <laughs> lot of copies of how to rewild <laughs> oh, i love that that's brilliant <laughs> jonathan you're you're so we've had derek gow up here the great right great, great na nature writers of, of our time of which you're now well, am i part of that am I? absolutely <laughs> um, you're steady on mate <laughs> so and uh, appreciate we were just uh, being that's let down right. by the met office again so if uh, if we'll, we'll forecast no that's rain right. so we're gonna keep going um but uh, the, 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 your, your, your manual has been a, a, a huge success, really. You, I was around you as you were writing it, and, and uh, it's obviously been fantastically supported by Fold. But um, can you tell me a, a little bit about, <laughs> or tell the audience a little bit about the kind of thinking behind the manual, what it is, and what you're trying to achieve with it? So we bought uh, Underhill, what, what is now called Underhill Wood Nature Reserve eight years ago, and... Um, 
I, you know, I sort of went to work with the land, and the concept at the beginning was to create a mosaic of habitats, as many habitats I could get within the 25 acres as, as, as we possibly could. And it got to a point where I had it, where that had been achieved. As unproductive clay yes, land. Yes, it, it was unproductive. Yeah. It wasn't, uh, I wasn't taking sort of decent farmland out of production. And it sort of got to a point where the, the habitats had been established. There was decent enough evidence to show that uh, a range of species had increased and there was sort of biodiversity coming back and, an, and, a, and, a, and a, a healthier... Dormice. Yes, dormice. <laughs> and a, and a healthier... A healthier um, piece of land. So there was something about, so where do I go next with this? And then the next obvious thing was to start teaching people who had land mm. how you do it. And one of the things that occurred to me, and I, I've sort of read pretty much all the rewilding literature, is that there was lots of stuff about, you know, one of the great books I think about rewilding is, is Jepson and Blythe's um, rewilding book. There was lots of books like that and Feral and, and, and um, Franz Vera's stuff and that was a lot about rewilding theory and, re and why, why, why rewilding works but what there wasn't anywhere in the market was I've got my 10 acres, I've got my 50 acres, what do I actually do? You know, how do, what, where do I start? And that, that came, it came from that, um, really. And, and the, the fact, you know, the Nep estate, which is the, the Isabella tree and Charlie Borrell estate which mm. lots of people are familiar with that's on a vast scale isn't it and although 20 20 plus acres is still a lot of land for most people it, it's a more kind of manageable kind of idea is that fair well I, I also I, th I think it's a numbers game so I, I'm a member of rewilding Britain the biggest and, and it, would, it would be wouldn't it just numerically it would be the biggest uh, the fastest growing bit of rewilding Britain is small rewilding projects mm. So they're getting, they get something like five new sm small rewilding projects joining their network every week because there are, you know, who, who can afford 3,000 acres in Sussex? Not many people, right? You know? Hang on. But some people can afford to buy... I'm right in the drip line. I'm going to go drip, back. We're in the drip trade. Back and forward. Let's go back. Yeah. And don't fall off the edge. Or forwards. Yeah, well, you are close to the there we are. Um... So not many people can afford to buy 3,000 acres, but a number of people can afford to buy one or half or mm. eight or ten. Really or and, and, <laughs> and, and so a whole lot of people, um, and indeed, as I said, I've had 73, 70 people through workshops Keke, in the last the year and a half. Like, huh? I've got another workshop like next weekend and yeah. they just fill immediately. So there is a great demand out there for people who have even just sort of big gardens and they want, you know, they want to bring biodiversity back into their garden. Um, so it, it fills that gap. Like I'm not, I'm just, I'm not sort of, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not sort of, uh, what I do and what goes on at NEP is quite different. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so there was, a, there was a sort of demand there, which I didn't know about, but the demand, it, 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 you know, the fact that the workshops and the books sell so well indicates that the demand I perceived existed, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, Amber, if, how how well has the has the manual sold, and uh, can you see can you see part two coming out soon? I can definitely see part two coming out soon. I mean, I think what I one of the things I like very much about the manual is it's slim, it's very practical, it's hands on, and you can really see in practice the things that you can do you know, even in your own garden or at home. Mm. So you don't have to have that huge land wealth to have it. And having had the chance to go and see um, the nature reserve as well, it's nice to be able to put that kind of practice. You know, that, that Jonathan's got and explained to people when they buy the book. It's, it's, I don't know, it's just really good. You know, even if he has got a very heavy kingfisher in it. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I'm just going to say that we take a 30-second break there and just uh, actually move forward on the stage because I think we have probably oh, moved in yes. the wrong direction okay. here. So yes. we'll okay. make a little edit to the talk, which I'm sure Ed will manage. So oh, yeah. eased off. Yeah. Back to the boy. Can you make sure your uh, receiver packs are... Uh, Oh, right. Yep. Uh, yep. Yes. Okay. There we go. So why don't we... Um, we've got 15 minutes left of the talk, so what I'd love to do, guys, is just explore a little bit about what our audience should be reading over the next year or so. Let's hope to goodness we don't go back into lockdown, but, um, <laughs> you know, clearly something happened there around... Re reading. Um, my dad's just arrived there, which is good to see. I know. What number are you up to, Dad, with your uh, post-lockdown reading? 
72 books <laughs> oh my since God. the lockdown. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, which is, uh, so you're nearly one book for each year of your life then. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. But, uh, is that 72 I've, books since lockdown? 72 books, and I can test wow. testify Fantastic. to that. That's extraordinary. Um, respect, respect. I, I mean, I, I don't think many people can say that they've read to quite that, d that degree. That's amazing. But um, I've certainly... Uh, found a uh, rekindled my passion for reading um, as a direct consequence of lockdown. I think I've read maybe 15 books since mm. the start. Um, and, you know, it, it, we've touched upon some of those titles in this conversation, but um, maybe if I could start with each of you, w did, I mean, clearly all of the, you three is, as writers um, and devourers of, of literature or, or sellers of literature um, <laughs> have been engaged all the way through. But was there a book that really took you during lockdown? For me, it was You're Wilding. But, but Wilding. I'll maybe start with, uh, start, with start with Jonathan and then go to you, Keggy. Can I go before lockdown? Does Definitely, that, okay. yeah, for sure. Because in fact, after our Zoom call, I sort of went away and I ended up with a list of 20. <laughs> 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 book. Um, but I'm gonna, I, I, I've got two, but in fact, I'll select one of those. So I think it's it's interesting if you think about books like Trespass and Wilding and my manual, um, Wildfell, Rebirding, um, Ben McDonald's amazing book on orchards, that the, the, the ecosystem that they don't write about and is, is not written about enough of the oceans. Mm -hmm. So three quarters of our planet is the ocean, right? And, and Helen, there's an amazing young author called Helen Scales who writes about it. Um, we, we don't give it writer. enough attention. It's not written about enough. It's studied a lot by academics, but the academic research never get, makes its way through into our books, right? Um, and there's this sort of, you know, the, 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 the irony of this is we have one of the planet's greatest marine biologists, Callum Roberts, who's head of marine biology at York University. He's in our midst, right? And do you, do you know him? Never heard of him? I've, I've heard of oh, him. Oh, you have heard of him? Because yeah. yeah, it's that thing, right? We all know about Robert McFarland yeah. or, or Ben McDonald, yeah. but we don't know of Callum Roberts. Mm. Callum Roberts wrote an extraordinary book in about 2015, 2012, called Ocean of Life. And that tells you everything you need to know about the planet's oceans. It's a great big book. It's based on his research and research of other academics. And it goes through every single habitat within that biome. And I, th I, and I think there's something about engaging in oceans. We don't engage in oceans anywhere near enough. So then, and then Helen Scales. Uh, if you've, once you've read that, you read The Brilliant Abyss. What a, what a writer, what a scientist. She's mm. completely brilliant. Um, all her books are brilliant. After that. Yeah. Amber, for you? Oh, no, hang on. I haven't done oh, mine. Okay. No, that's, <laughs> that's just a green. That's just a, a little warm-up. Okay. That's a problem. No, I'm, I'm not going to do a book because I have, read, I have for, for research, I've had to read... So, I'm almost up with your dad. Amazing. Um, but maybe not from cover to cover, but, you know, as far as volume, I've had to read a lot, a lot of uh, books for research. But I'm going to just say Richard Maybe, Richard Maybe, Richard Maybe, as still our living greatest nature writer. For me, I trust him implicitly. He, he manages to bring culture, art, science, but at the centre of everything is nature. And he is the most brilliant writer. And um, he's been slightly sidelined by this huge, wonderful renaissance that we've been talking about. But, you know, he, he really is... If I need to think about, am I... If I want to raise my game, I will go back to Richard Maybe. And the moment, you know, one sentence, I feel this relief that I'm with a, a really fabulous... Um, writer, so I'm just that's brilliant. Why Thank I'm you, that. Amber. Um, I have two actually. One which I love, and I don't want to read it too quickly, which is always the sign of a good no, book. It's been, yeah. And it's Peter Werleb, and it's the Hidden Language of Trees, mm -hmm. and it's one of those glorious books you can dip into in, in bits and pieces. And particularly during the pandemic, I found it quite hard to read. I found it quite hard to focus. So that book kind of appealed to me, and it talks about how trees communicate and how species shift little by little across Europe and what they do in terms of growth and collaboration and their sort of interaction with the biodiversity, whether it's the fungus or the insects around them, I found it absolutely fascinating. So yeah, you often find me kind of staring close to a tree. I'm not odd, I just stare at trees, <laughs> but that's rather nice. And then the second one that I really love and I heartily recommend, and it's kind of apt for today, it's called Light Rain Sometimes Fall. It's by Lev Parakan, and it came out last year and it thinks about 
nature not just a series of four seasons but a 72 micro season so it kind of takes the japanese approach oh, nice. and you'll look at a series of maybe four or five days and there's starlings start to gather or light rain sometimes fall or the bluebells smell nice but they're not all here yet and it's a very gentle light observation on the tiny changes that mark the shift towards bigger seasons and it's a beautiful beautiful book do the Japanese have 72 sort of demarcations? They do, it, do they? they do. And there's actually a new book coming out where wow. somebody else is talking about that. Um, so that's I see that as being the next shift is kind of like these micro seasons and these little moments. Because it's really interesting. I, it, it, ravens start displaying to each other in December. So is that spring? You know, there's, there is that thing, isn't there? Yeah. You know, they're one of the very, very early birds. They, they build their nests in February. Yeah. So there's that thing about, so I think that idea of breaking that down, that's fascinating. It is. It's, it's not just spring, I need to autumn. come into the shop. <laughs> well, do you know, we have some. <laughs> uh, women writers, yeah. marginal community. There's a, a, a woman called Jenny Reddy who's written yeah. about Wonderland. Wonderland, yeah. We, and, we, you know, it needs to expand. It's been criticised as being sort of the lone white male out there. <laughs> um, uh Helen McDonald's a fantastic writer. Her mm. Vesper Flights, a wonderful book of essays, and obviously H is for which is what she's famous for. But there's a lot of really good women writers and really good poets. Al Alice mm. Oswald and Kathleen Jamie. And yeah. There's some really good women nature mm. writers out there. So. And I think it's just yeah, kind of just very quickly. It's really important to recognise that nature access to nature and writing is not the preserve of the lone white male in his gaiters there are people of color people of different backgrounds ages gender who have access to mm. nature and their stories are starting to be told more but not enough yet yeah. and to be challenged because you look different to the people around you when you're walking through a field that's not right you have to be able to have confidence to go out and walk and as a woman be feel you know, feel safe walking as somebody who might look a little bit different, to not be challenged if you're walking across the field. You have every yeah. right to be there. Can I help you? Exactly. It's, are you lost? <laughs> are you lost? <laughs> that's the great line, isn't it, from the Hayes book, which yeah. is, you oh, know, yeah. that sort of awful patronising yeah. tone that some landowners or gatekeepers for landowners will... It's, you're in a field and you know, or maybe you don't know, maybe you do know that you're not meant to be there. Um, but that line where someone will come up to you, it's not, get off my land, it's... Can I help you? <laughs> no, which is basically... It's a great effort. British insult, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> With my father, it was a shotgun tractor <laughs> and therefore... <laughs> uh, so, something else about books, just before we sort of finish, that I'd like to sort of put out there. Um, one of the... one of the th It's interesting, my reading, I've sort of moved in the last sort of five years, and it comes from owning the land. I've moved on to reading sort of voraciously the New Naturalist series. Mm. And if you want to do a deep dive into the ecology of species, then those books are just mind-blowing. They're amazing. Mm. Every book is like doing a university paper. I'm sort of halfway through the one on owls at the moment. He's, he's probably the only person I know that reads them from beginning to end. Most people dip in and they need to know about kingfishers or they need to, but he'll just start at the beginning and read all the way through the end and remember half of it. As well. But I think there is that thing of, you know, there is, I, I think there's that thing about just moving yourself deeper into the ecology yeah. of, so, you know, the dragonfly one was extraordinary. So, you know, what, what, how do these species operate? within their habitats mm -hmm. at a really deep scientific level and that's when you sort of because that's the wonder mm -hmm. right that's you know something I, I i read in the owl book and i i sort of partly knew this barn owl a single barn owl have a range of five thousand hectares mm -hmm. and across that which is a ridiculous amount of land it's most of salisbury plain and across that five thousand hectares it requires 50 hectares of ground which then gives it prey prey species mm -hmm. so stuff like that is just the, that's the wonder you know understanding that ecology is the wonder tell the audience a couple of good facts about dragonflies because i remember when you took me around the uh, around the reserve and we indeed the planted team came down and spent some time on the reserve Christ, last summer that's on the spot but what did i say you know, it was, you know, stuff about, i mean they're the oldest they're, they're yeah. so old aren't they? i mean no, they've they been were, around for so long and they were the old. first things ever to fly there you go yes um and and the old they, and they they were the they were the first things on the planet ever to fly they the the oldest fossils go to back to about 350 million years ago and and they were about the wingspan was about a meter mm. Um, and do you know why they were that big? Or no. you couldn't, they couldn't possibly be that big now, even yep. if 
they grew to, they couldn't survive because we don't have enough oxygen, oxygen in, in yeah, the, it. Right. So it was about the oxygen oxygen levels, because they can get the oxygen in quick. Whereas now they, it, it, you know, the way they're structured with their sort of carotene, they can't. It won't. They can't be that big anymore. Amazing. And the, the other lovely dragonfly thing is at the land at Underhillwood Nature Reserve. Um, there's now hobby and hobby specialise in yeah. the dragonflies. They're a tiny little um, falcon, wingspan about that that wide. Super nimble, aren't they? And, well, they just come blasting across the lake, and they at, at the bottom of their arc, they're doing somewhere between seventy and ninety miles an hour, wow. and they predate exclusively on dragonfly, and that's just amazing to watch. I've seen that a few times. Yeah. yeah. We're co I'm very conscious we're we're running out of time now, but um, Keggy at the top of the conversation I obviously introduced you as the author of Beastly I'm going to ask Amber probably to have the last word if I may just after I've asked you this question because uh, I want to hear apart from Jonathan's second rewilding manual what the really hot take of 2023 is going to be but I'm sure one of them is going to be Beastly so uh, Keggy can you tell us what to expect in this um, I've, what I have no doubt will be a, a brilliant book that's coming out next year well I hope I hope, because it really is for, for the community of creatures that we share this planet with. And that is, um, I thought, you know, it was before um, lockdown that I started this book and I was sent this extraordinary photograph by my agent that pretty much sent the trajectory of me on this path to work out our relationship with, with, with creatures and where it had gone really well and where it had gone really badly, and, but in every walk of life. And so I started at really the birth of um, human culture when we started, when we knew how to paint them better than we did, you know, in Victorian Britain. The cave painters uh, were much more accurate in the way creatures ran, I mean, animals uh, like the auric and the... So I started there and went all the way to the sixth extinction where we are now. Um, and I just wanted to tell the story in a really palatable way. So I've used my emissaries have been animals and um, specific. So it's a story driven book uh, through particular stories of our relationship with an the animal world and uh, individuals and the most astonishing stories that I could find that were telling in the, the bigger picture. So lots of small stories to tell the bigger picture. So yeah, sounds sounds amazing, well, and um, I I'd highly recommend that uh, if you are looking out for books next year, that you uh, look January out for January the fifth, Keggy's book. <laughs> January, the the 5th, <laughs> January the sixth. January the sixth. definitely be stopped in fold. Um, it fifth. will indeed. Yeah. Amber, for you, um, what are you looking forward to? What's coming up on the on the on the radar that our audience might want to look to look to read in yeah. the next few months? Well, I think what's interesting, um, there's a, an amazing folk singer called Sam Lee, and he talks about oh, yeah. nightingales, and he talks about how you gently challenge declining species and challenge opinion, and he has a, a phrase which is to um, to change the opposition, create a better party, and so what we're seeing now, much more of a shift about book towards books which are seeing how individuals can do that and how individuals can actually engage in positive actions positive activism and to challenge the things which are affecting kind of our natural environment so I see more of a trend towards that Regenesis yeah George Monbiot's new yes book yeah the new out. one coming out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it will it will yeah. that's on my list <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so lots to look forward to um guys it's been as I expected absolutely fascinating brilliant and heartwarming to have you all on the the stage and sharing this platform with us here today thank you all so much for thank you being for with us at planted country thank you, thank you to our audience for sitting here um a <laughs> little drier than we are up here but we're <laughs> we're, uh, we're moving through but um uh, we're so grateful for everyone here for supporting planted country to the national trust thank you so much to everybody um, involved, our panel of experts, this is the last talk of uh, our inaugural event here, um, which I hope everyone who's attended these talks um, and indeed the workshops, the botanical market, the natural living section, mm. some amazing sustainable furniture brands, some amazing uh, brands and businesses that place nature and the environment at the heart of everything they do. We hope at Planted we're providing a platform which enables nature to really be the common ground that we can all um, rally round because it needs our support obviously, um, but we're extraordinarily grateful to everybody who's been part of this first event. So thank you so much for being here today. That just leaves it for me to say 
Um, if you've enjoyed what you've seen on here, please visit our website, www.planted-community.co.uk, where you'll find more brilliant content, nature-based editorial video content to enjoy. Um, so please go on there and subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you more information around future events that are coming up. So thank you so much. Lastly, to my panellists, obviously, again, thank you. Uh, my name's Sam Peters, and this has been Save Our Soil Talks. Thank you.